Our next speaker is Rachel Lindsay. She is a born researcher and explorer who spent her formative years chasing wildlife in the hills and hollers of Tennessee and Kentucky, often barefooted. Her feral-esque, what a charming word is that, her feral-esque childhood instilled in her a deep-rooted passion for the outdoors with a special affinity for water and caves. Eventually, she turned her love of nature into a life's work, pursuing a bachelor's degree in wildlife and fisheries management with a forestry minor, followed by a master's degree in wildlife management. She has extensive experience in land stewardship and conservation, prescribed fire, and ecological research. Throughout her career, she has prioritized connecting people and communities to nature through ecological education, land conservation, and stewardship. She dreams of a privately owned million acre hill country national park. Oh, wouldn't that be lovely? <laughs> Rachel is a lifelong poet, naturalist, spiritualist, and Lorax. She speaks for the trees. She is also the Director of Science and Stewardship at the Hill Country Conservancy. So take it away, Rachel. Thank you so much, Paula. It's great to see your face and uh, to have people here today to hear about this important topic. Um, this has been a really a labor of love for me in discovering how important the ash juniper tree is to our ecology and understanding how the hill country really functions. And I think that's an essential part of figuring out how to protect this amazing paradise that we get to live in here in Central Texas. So I realized yesterday while I was working on this um, presentation that a much better title might have been Texas Hill Country Past, Present, and Future, because that's what a lot of this presentation is about. Uh, and a less evocative title as well. Uh, but I'm excited to share this with you guys and take you on a journey of the things that I have learned. Uh, much of this is thanks to the other experts and um, conservation biologists and landowners who are in the hill country who have shared their knowledge and their love of this land with me over the past 15 years. So I'm really thankful for the community that we have here in Central Texas and honored to be one of the people who gets to help protect this land. So first, I think we have to define the hill country, and it's sort of a, a jellyfied concept for most of us because we have a good idea of that southern and eastern edge. Uh, oh, yay, I can do a laser. So this uh, Falcone's fault line that follows I-35 from Austin to San Antonio. Most of us have a good idea of where that edge is, but uh, when you get further out western and northward in the Edwards Plateau, it becomes a little bit harder to define for most people. So this is actually a map from the EPA. They have ecoregions of the entire United States, and these are the e EPA ecoregions for the state of Texas. Um, we're not going to read through all of this, so don't have a heart attack on that. Uh, and I'm actually going to blow up the hill country and the Edwards Plateau here so that we can look at it a little bit easier. Uh, so you see there's Austin here, San Antonio is just inside the Blackland Prairie, just outside of the Edwards Plateau, which is this green, these different green colors, and there are four different pieces to the Edwards Plateau. The first, this 30A, which is this kind of donut that goes here and includes the Pernalis River, the headwaters of the Lano River, and the San Saba River. That is called the Edwards Plateau Woodlands. And uh, I've highlighted some important concepts. This is all available online, and I will post some links into the chat uh, at the end of this talk for where you guys can look up some of this information and uh, read in more detail yourself if you want to in the future. So the important thing about the Everest Plateau woodland is that it receives sufficient rainfall to support a woodland. And that's in contrast to the semi-arid Edwards Plateau, which we'll get to you there at the end. Um, this part of the Edwards Plateau has enough 
rainfall to support forests. That's a really important concept to remember. Um, the profile of the hills in the Edwards Plateau woodland and also the Balcones Canyonlands and the Llano Uplift is uh, rounded and that's due to the chemical weathering process from the amount of precipitation that we get in this area. The Llano Uplift is actually a basin, it's a bowl. And so uh, in some places, the basin is a thousand feet below the level of the surrounding limestone. And what happened is uh, limestone eroded from what was historically at that same level as the surrounding areas and uh, collapsed and revealed that underlying granite that is, uh, has been dated at at least a billion years old with a B, billion, it's amazing. Uh, the soils in the Llano Basin tend to be acidic. And then we have the Balcones Canyon lands, this southeastern boundary of the Edwards Plateau. Uh, this says that the Edwards Plateau was uplifted during the Miocene epoch, which was five to 23 million years ago. Uh, we'll see some conflicting information with that here in a minute, but you know, as a scientist, you know, we're always learning and we're always challenging what we believed in the past and uh, trying to amplify our work to build upon what we've already learned. Uh, the Balcones Canyon lands are highly dissected and that's because of the erosion and solution of springs, streams, and rivers working in that area both above and below ground. So this is a really important area where there's a lot of water moving above ground and below ground and it's causing that dissolution of all of that limestone. There's a number of endemic plants in the Balcones Escarpment, uh, the Balcones Canyonlands, uh, and there's eastern deciduous forest in this area, which was probably a relic of um, those eastern communities back when this used to be one cohesive unit, which we'll see in a, um, a couple of slides. So that's moisture and cooler climates that are remnants from that Pleistocene glacial epoch, which was 11,700 to 2.5 million years ago. And then this western part, this 30B labeled, which has these two separate sections, uh, is the semi-arid Edwards Plateau. And there's actually a lot of confusion about the hill country versus the Edwards Plateau because really it's a line of climate that demarcates the uh, hill country from the Edwards Plateau. And it's roughly along this line that separates the semi-arid Edwards Plateau to the west from the Edwards Plateau woodlands to the east. And so it's all about the ability for those lands to receive enough precipitation to grow forests. And this Western part, the semi-arid Edwards Plateau is not capable of sustaining a forest uh, with the amount of precipitation that they get there. So um, that's the huge difference there. In the semi-arid Edwards Plateau, the hills are not rounded like they are in the hill country. They are steep and sharp. And that's because erosion occurs in those areas through rock fall at the margins of those um, mesas rather than through limestone dissolution through precipitation. Uh, and I have some links for this that I'll share. So that kind of brings us to hill country geology. There was quite a bit of geology within that section. And this center part where you can see this distinct circular shape, that's the Llano Basin. So this is where you see those um, exposed rocks from Precambrian time, 600 million years to a billion years old rocks that have been exposed. Uh, this green, so that aligns with the edge of the Balcones Canyon lands and the Balcones Fault Zone, which actually stretch all the way up into Oklahoma. And uh, that is limestone that was deposited during times when Texas, when this land area was covered with shallow seas. And so those species that lived in those seas um, deposited over millions of years, these limestone um, 
sediments and those accumulated and that's what we see today and then through those seas coming and going across Texas over millions of years uh, there was dissolution of that limestone, there was more sedimentation and deposition, there was erosion. So uh, that's how we ended up with all of our aquifers and these camp cars cave systems. So this is a really cool website that I'll also share in the chat. Uh, it's Dinosaur Database and they have this globe that shows you, you can choose up here at the top, what did earth look like? And I think it goes back to 750 million years ago. Uh, and you can get these shots where you can actually, you can grab it and move it around. This is just a screenshot of what it looked like. Uh, so you can see Texas there and this red pin is actually New Braunfels. So you can see 500 million years ago that most of North America was covered in a shallow sea. And then about 300 million years ago is when the different land masses met and they pushed up and they pushed up these mountains that are the Appalachians here in Tennessee, Kentucky, North Carolina, all the way up to New York and into Canada. And those stretched all the way to the Washitas in uh, Oklahoma and Arkansas and through central Texas where we are and into northern Mexico. So that uplifting has been present for a long time. And that's what I'm telling you is in contrast to what the EPA is saying that it happened about 100 uh, or 25 million years ago. So, you know, when you start talking about millions of years, it gets a little bit difficult to decide exactly when things happen. So those, that uh, uplift from the land masses crashing together. And then when they started to pull apart millions of years later, they um, pulled that mountain range apart. So you'll see in this 120 million years ago, it really only shows that that mountain range still existing from New York down to like Northern Georgia uh, and doesn't show it here in Texas and Mexico though we know that's all part of the same historical range. And this map on 105 years ago shows some more stuff there in Louisiana and Arkansas. So. Texas was covered in these shallow oscillating seas that deposited and eroded those sediments. And those deposits along with corals and other uh, life forms that lived there form this limestone deposits. And those deposits are formational for our cave systems. This is just one last globe to show you uh, 66 million years ago, 50 million years ago. So over various points in time, we've had seas that have come into uh, parts of the United States and flooded those areas and then receded with time. It's a really cool uh, website to play around on. So what we ended up with is this karst system where we have uh, limestone that is stacked and uh, compressed beneath our soils, and that gives us these places to have aquifers and caves uh, where the water table is depends on how full our aquifers are and that there's pressure on those. There's a, a whole underground system that's happening to push that aquifer water up in some places into springs and streams to be able to recharge those aquifers through um, underground systems or sinkholes, caves, fissures, uh, cracks in the land where rainwater is able to recharge. And then there's also this entire system on the soil and how much water is able to be absorbed by our soil here in the hill country. So in my mind, this aquifer recharge and keeping our springs and streams flowing is the highest and best use of the hill country and especially into the future as freshwater resources are likely to become more rare and especially unpolluted freshwater resources. Uh, this aligns really perfectly with what we've seen so far with the geology, which of course, you know, aquifers are heavily dependent on the geology. One thing to notice, this major aquifer map, there's 
really nothing that occurs there under the Lana Basin as far as major aquifers. There are, uh, I think, three minor aquifers that occur there in the Lana Basin with the very center of that basin not having anything but localized, very localized aquifers. And um, that means that they have a, a very small amount of water availability. Uh, and I think that that's probably because that used to be an aquifer and the entire aquifer system collapsed. And that's why we don't see the, land, the uh, limestone deposits as much in the Lano Basin. We see these pre-Cambrian um, geologies instead. But that's just me theorizing. So what we end up with is uh, this map of the hill country. The Edwards Plateau woodlands are in that light blue color. The Lano Basin is in that orange color. And the green color is the Balcones Canyon lands. And again, this western boundary is really a line of climate beyond which a forest can't really be supported. And uh, the weathering looks very different in the limestone. Uh, and so you can see in this map, Austin, all the way down to San Antonio. And what strikes me is that through this um, erosion and deposition process over millions of years, we've ended up with uh, basically a remnant island of that ancient uh, mountain course, the Appalachians that run, that did run at one time from Mexico all the way to Canada. And so we have kind of this little remnant island and it sits in the middle of much sandier soils, of really a sea of grassland. So we have this tiny hill country island in the grassland and that's what gives us all those crazy rare species and aquifer species is because we became isolated and basically made an island habitat. So a fun game here, if people want to throw out into the chat, I have a few pictures from different rivers in different ecological areas of the Edwards Plateau. Does anybody want to guess where this picture was taken the Devil Rivers. Okay, very good. The Devil's River. Um, this is the semi arid Edwards Plateau. It is the Devil's River. And uh, the big giveaway on that is that um, these hills in the back, oh, there we go, get my laser pointer going. You can see how they've sheared off rather than being rounded from weathering. You can see clearly this area does not support forest, not even alongside the river's edge. Is there a, like a band of forest? It's very grassy and short early successional um, vegetation species. Okay, any guesses on that one? I'm gonna give everybody a, a second to anybody wants to type anything in the chat. It would be fun for us to yell out, but I think I could get messy. <laughs> the Lano River, yes. Yeah. So you see these um, pink granite stones, which is a huge giveaway, right, for the Lano. Perfect. Uh, that's Enchanted Rock. Again, the pink granite uh, that stands out. Uh, so any guesses on this one? And I saw that um, Sarah Jenkins asked in the chat, is all of the hill country geology a remnant of the Appalachian range or is it just the Balcony Canyon land? So what it looks like to me is that all of the Edwards Plateau is a remnant, but uh, I'm not really positive about that. I don't know how much squished up back when Pangea formed and these are still just formational things that I'm learning and theorizing about. So hopefully I'll be able to come back next year with more information for NITSOT and be able to talk to you guys about those things. Uh, so Frio, that's a good guess. Uh, this is actually in the Edwards Plateau Woodlands and I'll give you another picture and maybe some of you will guess it based on this picture. This is actually one of America's most endangered rivers, if that gives it away. Um, this is the San Saba, and in the headwaters of the San Saba, there's a lot of groundwater pumping 
for irrigation and for people and it's running that river dry frequently, especially when we have drought. Uh, the San Saba is a hot spot for freshwater mussels. So this is an even scarier proposition that we're letting a river run dry that is a, a site for these endangered and rare um, freshwater mussels. Uh, so one last one, and this one's hopefully super easy, but um, you guys have gotten pretty much everything else. Um, the left picture is the Narrows on the Blanco River. And so this one is in the uh, Balcones Canyon lands. And the right picture is also the Blanco River. And then this last one is Cypress Creek, uh, which feeds into the Blanco River. So uh, again, that relic swamp community with the bald cypress and big, big riparian areas that are close canopy forested. Uh, I just, I just love our hill country rivers and paradise that we get to live in. So when we look at our island of hill country, uh, this map shows every single ravine and drainage that goes into any stream in the hill country. And what you can see is that it's really hard to get anywhere that you're not in the drainage in the hill country. It's essentially one big drainage. And historically, I know I've heard that uh, ash juniper or cedar, as most people call it, is only native to those drainages. And I can test that with this map. So where is it not native to in the hill country? If it's only native to drainages, right? Um, again, this island concept about the hill country really helps me to think about how to restore and protect the hill country. And I was actually fascinated to realize that the Balcones Canyon lands, which are shown on that right map in green along the southeastern edge, the Balcones Canyon lands are about the same size as the land mass of the Hawaiian Islands. Uh, so we actually have a way better opportunity to protect these areas and to offer resiliency to our health country and these ecosystem services upon which we really depend for life here and, and which we really love too because they're beautiful and we get to recreate in them uh, than they do in Hawaii because as an island in an ocean, a landmass island in an ocean, it's very exposed to any sort of um, destruction, destructive event in that area. But here in the hill country, because we're surrounded by a sea of grassland, what was historically grassland, the Great Plains, um, we are much more buffered from those events. You know, we're not gonna have a hurricane that comes straight across us, hopefully. I don't know, my weather's getting pretty weird lately. Um, and we're offered a lot of resiliency because of the species that grow here. So I was excited to hear that Hawaii is 4.4 million acres and the Balcones Canyon lands is about that same amount of time or same amount of land. Um, so I feel like we have a real opportunity for protection here. Uh, this is a short video on the biotic pump because this explains it so much better than I could and you might need a break and I can take a drink of water. <laughs> All around the world, traditional wisdom has it that forests bring the rain. Scientists have scoffed at this notion for a while. The forests grow where there's ample precipitation, but they do not cause that precipitation. It comes because of winds that are governed by geomechanical processes, which have nothing to do with where the forests are in art. Water does not tend to stay in one spot for very long. Most of it ends up running off into the ocean via rivers. Unless there's some way for the moisture from the ocean to come back inland, all of the land's water would be gone very quickly as with the forest. According to the geomechanical view, moisture gets transferred inland when water vapor is carried from the ocean by winds. Because some of this water gets lost to precipitation, the deeper inland this air gets, the less moist it becomes. Therefore, deeper inland means less rainfall. If this view is true, we should expect to only see forests near the coasts and drier, more arid areas the farther inland we go. But this is not what we find. Where there are still natural forests, precipitation does not decrease with distance from the ocean. 
In fact, it often increases the greatest amount of rainfall being in the deepest parts of the forest, sometimes thousands of miles from the coast. This is unexpected and difficult to explain with the geomechanical view. What on earth can be attracting so much water to a spot so far from the ocean, and why? While there is more water in the ocean than in forests, forested areas have more water vapor in the air. This is because forests, especially healthy ones, have a lot more surface area for water to evaporate off of. Multiple canopy layers, shrubs, moisture-laden ground are all full of water, which transpires or evaporates entering the air. As a result, we find much more water vapor in the forest, even when there is less total water. The ample amount of water vapor in the forest rises and condenses into clouds, changing from gas to liquid. This creates a drop in air pressure, which allows even more vapor-filled air to rise. This creates an upward air current, which in turn creates a horizontal current closer to the ground. This sucks in air from higher pressure areas, like the air from over the ocean. This air contains some water vapor, which increases the total amount of water in the forest, leading to more frequent rainfall. But essentially, forests create a giant constant air current that attracts moisture from hundreds of miles away. This is how we find so much water so far from the ocean. Forests bring it in. This process is known as the biotic pump. And it shows how traditional wisdom was right all along. Forests really do bring them in. So as more forests are clear-cut, the more extreme become the droughts, and the more expansive become the deserts. If we want to thrive on this planet, we need to preserve and regenerate the forests. All right, so I totally nerd out over all this stuff. We're only just beginning to understand the biotic pump and forests and our water cycle and ecology of our planet as ecologists and uh, biologists. And so this is really cutting edge uh, information and uh, thought processes. Uh, um, so I'm certainly still understanding how all of this works. And this is a very complicated infographic that gives you an idea of how much of that condensation comes from our forest. And the interesting thing is this actually aligns to what we've seen historically in the hill country. In the 1940s was when we had the most forest clearing and brush clearing in uh, our history because they were, um, settlers were, using it for wood, for fence posts, selling it for materials. Um, ash juniper was also used for railroad ties. And uh, then they were burning and grazing livestock on those lands, uh, much like what's happening right now in Amazon, where they're cutting down that forest and then using it to graze livestock. Uh, and then in the 50s is when we saw these, this huge drought, and that was across the United States that um, that drought hit. But here in Texas, it took us seven years to get out of it. And when we finally did, we had torrential rain and floods in 1957. And those took a lot of our soils with them too. So I think Historically, we've lost a lot of that millions of years of production that happened in the hill country of our vegetation. And in a lot of areas, we're starting with ground zero. Um, ash juniper happens to be a species that can colonize those ground zero areas. And so it's really fantastic as a pioneer for us and as a pioneer of those closed canopy forest systems. Most forest species can't survive in a fully daylit situation. They uh, aren't able to survive in those conditions, but ash juniper miraculously uh, thrives on terrible soils and fully daylit heat and drought and those torrential rainfall. It really, um, it has a lot of adaptations that make it a special species for us here. So what is a keystone species? It's basically a species that when you remove it from that ecosystem, uh, other parts of the ecosystem start to collapse other than exactly you know, the relationships that we're aware of. And as a wildlife biologist, biologist I theorize that really every species plays a keystone role. We just don't always recognize it as humans, uh, but 
some have noticeably um, demonstrable effects on their ecosystem. The gray wolf has uh, been recently understood because of its effects on the Yellowstone ecosystem and how much that ecosystem diversified and grew once wolves were reintroduced to that environment. Uh, the American bison is widely known as a driver of that Great Plains ecosystem and its loss and destruction uh, by our federal government is what drove the loss of the Great Plains. So if we want to restore that ecosystem, we actually need to restore bison as well. Uh, keystone species got its name from a keystone and uh, this is a, a, a rock arch and the keystone is that center stone that holds the whole rock, the whole arch up. So this part of the arch is leaning against that stone and sitting on here. This part is leaning against it and sitting on there. And the keystone itself doesn't actually hold the weight of the arch, but without it, the entire arch falls apart. So that's where that concept came from. Um, keystone species usually go into one of four different categories, predators, uh, which obviously ash juniper is not a predator, so we won't spend too much time talking about that, but if you're interested, read about the wolves in Yellowstone, it's a, a super fascinating story, and there's some really cool videos on that too. Uh, mutualist species that work in connection with other species or provide things for other species, a really great example of this is fungus, uh, mycelium, who provide uh, nutrients to trees and grasses from the soil and in return get sugars from those vegetative species that are able to do photosynthesis. So it's kind of a, um, a really cool example. And Susan Samard's book, Finding the Mother Tree, is really interesting to uh, talk about how forests work in connection with mycelium. Uh, those fungal species. So um, ash juniper is actually an ecosystem engineer, just like both of these species to the right, the uh, beaver and prairie dogs. They do create a habitat, they create a forest, and they um, are able to define the overall biodiversity, which is something that we don't normally think about here in the health country with ash juniper. We sort of vilify it because it's not great if you want to graze livestock and that's been our history here. Um, but it does create that forest system that we had here historically and I really enjoyed the garden walks because there's so many of those species that would have occurred in a closed canopy forest in the hill country. I'm fascinated to think about what we had here that's been lost over the past 150 years. Uh, and then ash juniper is obviously a plant, and so it provides food, water, and shelter to other plants and animals. Um, we're not going to spend too much time on that obvious part of it, because I, I could honestly talk about ash juniper, and I do talk about ash juniper with um, some of my fellow conservation biologists uh, an hour a month. <laughs> Um, so we have a lot of information to fit into the rest of this uh, talk. Um, it's also an umbrella species, and I just wanted to throw that out there, a species that if we can start aiming to protect it, we protect biodiversity in general, and we actually protect our ecological services here in the Hill Country, which is even more important, especially that freshwater aspect. So uh, my kids both homeschool, and yesterday my 12-year-old Gray asked me what a keystone species was because he saw my slide, and so I was telling him about keystone species, and he said, oh, my pollinators. So I had to put this picture in there. Um, our pollinators are absolutely keystone species, uh, and this picture also happens to have a great view of John Knox Ranch on the Blanco River. The Blanco is, let's see if I can identify it right there. Uh, and our ash juniper doing what it does best, trying to recreate for us. Um, so when I kind of start thinking about what our historical vegetation might have looked like in the Hill Country, I like to look at topographic maps a lot of times and uh, look at some of these different places and what they've been named. 
And uh, this place stood out to me, Cedar Mountain here in Lano County. This is uh, the Lano Gillespie County line. Here's Blanco County over here. You can see the blue of the Edwards Plateau woodlands. So we're in the Lano Basin here. And you've got Cedar Mountain. So you know that historically, there was a lot of cedar in the hill country. There's a lot of places named after the cedar. There's actually a lot of written information about how much um, cedar was in the hill country and how much they used it. This was written in 1719 on an expedition through Texas. And they said that they tried to uh, get to the source of the Guadalupe River. They traveled and could not reach any further because there were uh, the woods were so thick and there were so many rocks and obstructions getting upstream. So uh, in 1719, at least, the Guadalupe River was extremely forested and uh, a hindrance to travel. This is in 1874 and it's from the uh, statesman. The cedar tie business has contributed to the growth and prosperity of the Hill City, which is uh, what Austin was called back then, more especially in the last 12 months. And it says a gentleman from the Central Railroad said that 200,000 cedar uh, ties, which were railroad ties, have been shipped from the Hill City in the last two years. And they fetch about 60 to 90 cents each. So that was a huge revenue source back in 1874. Now it's kind of devastating to think how much growth was taken for 60 to 90 cents a tree. Uh, that's a steal in today's time. In general, this is 1904 and this is William Bray. He wrote a uh, brochure. Oh, <laughs> The timber of the Edwards Plateau, I don't know if you can see, it's kind of shiny. Uh, he wrote that in 1904, and it was for the Bureau of Forestry in the U.S. Department of Agriculture, the timber of the Edwards Plateau. And he says, in general, the Edwards Plateau is a timbered region only in the deeply eroded portions, becoming prairie on the level uplands, and finally passing into the great grass plains which stretch northward into Canada. One must, however, distinguish many degrees of forestation according to the relative amount of moisture. Through a gradual dwarfing and thinning out of the timber passes from the big, heavy growth of the water canyons to the stunted, the continuous forest of the hills and bluffs and the scant tree growth of the loose stony slopes in the eastern part of the area, until at the west there remains only scattered chaparral. Uh, so to me, just one more nail in the coffin of thinking about the hill country as only a grassland. It was those flat areas that were capable of sustaining grasslands that had that grassland in it and likely had buffalo coming and perpetuating that system. And then the slopes and uh, the top of those hills, which are um, very steep themselves, would have had ash juniper that was cut and removed during um, the late 1700s all the way through today. Uh, so it's just been this continuous cutting of those forests. Uh, some more information on uh, the amount of timber that there was in the Hill Country. And these slides uh, on the historic history of the Hill Country come from Lisa O'Donnell's Ecology of the Texas Hill Country which I linked to in that original reference document that uh, goes along with the slideshow. Uh, and they also relate to Elizabeth McGreevy's book, Wanted Mountain Cedar Dead and Alive, which just came out a few months ago and is an excellent reference and resource for thinking about these myths of ash juniper. So this uh, particular slide talks about that cedar was also used for fuel and that enormous amounts of ash juniper were cut to use to burn for fuel to keep people warm, uh, which is something that we don't really think about anymore. And then again, railroad ties, poles, posts, sills, and other articles which utilize its great durability. So uh, I believe it was in the Cedar Chopper's book that he talks about 
ash juniper posts were used as far away as California and Montana. And um, yeah, the railroad ties stretched across Texas at least. And I think they were used even way out east in like Virginia. So this is William Bray again, a deplorable loss of cedar has taken place from break fires. For half a century, these periodically occurred areas which have not been burned over are the exception. So most areas have been burned at that point and it was because of um, these fires that actually got out um, from people burning slash. So exactly like what we're seeing in the Amazon each year where they're cutting those uh, ancient rainforest trees and then burning the slash so that they can graze, graze livestock. That's the same thing that happened here in the hill country. It just happened 150 years ago. Uh, so this is a study that was done by the city of Austin and the blue graphs are how many trees that they sampled that uh, were seedlings in that year uh, or that decade. And then the red bars are, oops, uh, the number of fire stars that were observed in those um, samples, tree slab samples that were collected. And so you can see that the fire stars start in the late 1800s and peak in the 1940s, 1950s, 1960s. Uh, and that's because that's when they were primarily burning for livestock grazing. So what we have in the hill country is historically, we have this established climax community, which wouldn't have always had ash juniper in it, especially as those communities get older, the ash junipers become less prevalent and other trees uh, become part of that canopy. So we probably had a, a extremely biodiverse canopy. Um, they came through and cut a lot of the forest, used it for timber and fuel. And then uh, not only did they cut it, then they burned it and they grazed it. And so normally what would happen is then you have soil remaining and you have these fast growing plants that are initially dominant mate, like um, the graphic shows. But what happened in the hill country is we've gotten these huge, crazy torrential floods. And so we lost a lot of that soil as well. So not only did we lose the vegetation and the way that that community works ecologically, we lost the soil. And so we've got plants that can grow on basically bedrock that are trying to reestablish that community. This graphic shows um, what happens when you have a, uh, a forest that's functioning optimally. There's evapotranspiration, just like what happened in the video. I'm going to go pretty fast through this so that we have time for um, comments at the end. So when it's deforested, then uh, you have the chance to have erosion and uh, our rivers and streams also erode. Um, so we have that, that uh, really rapid runoff, uh, evapotranspiration decreases, which means our precipitation also decreases. And when we do get precipitation, it's highly destructive to the soils. This is another infographic that shows that same concept. Um, when we deforest an area, we end up with infertile soils. We have no trees protecting those soils. We have no leaves dropped as litter, which means we have less nutrition in the soil, less organic matter in the soil. And so the soil is not capable of holding as much water and infiltrating as much water into the aquifer and it changes that composition of the soil so that uh, vegetation isn't able to grow as easily. So this is um, a picture from a property with a, an older closed canopy ash juniper forest. And you can see that we do indeed have really deep rich soils under uh, those ash juniper forests. And uh, City of Austin has also been doing some research about the soils under juniper moss. So this shows five times the amount of organic carbon as the surrounding soils on this um, location. 
This one shows that old junipers are even better than young junipers, and those are even better than grasslands. So really important to our soil organic matter. This infographic comes from Kiss the Ground, and um, important just to show the importance of soil health. The more organic matter that we have in the soil, the more biodiversity we're capable of sustaining on the ground in terms of vegetation, and the better that vegetation can protect the ground. So this is kind of our mandate here in the hill country. How can we protect our soil? And uh, that protects our water. One more clue to the history of forests in the hill country is uh, kind of our iconic endangered species, the golden sheep warbler. And if you look at the golden sheep warbler range, it actually really highly overlaps with that range of ash juniper. And uh, most people know that ash juniper actually stretches into the Washington Mountains in Oklahoma and into Northern Mexico. And that's all part of that um, historic range of those Appalachians. There's the juniper hair streak butterfly. So another species that has uh, adapted to juniper, ash juniper, um, and juniper species in general, and is in this range. And juniper actually acts as a nursery. So from observations uh, from all across, the Balcones Canyonlands primarily is where we're talking about ash juniper being super important. As you go out into the Edwards Plateau woodlands, you tend to have sandier, deeper soils with less of a um, the aquifer system isn't the same as it is in the Balcones Canyonlands. It's um, confined aquifers and they are um, more strict with where they are and how much water is leaching through them. And so um, some parts of the Edwards Plateau Woodlands, which is where Fredericksburg is, actually have like post oak savanna communities, it appears, um, which would have been remnants from those communities that stretch all the way up into Oklahoma too. So it's really interesting to see how the hill country is this conglomeration of different things, but also kind of an island that functions on its own. Uh, there are some plants that exclusively or almost exclusively associate with ash juniper, like cedar sage. Uh, there are some species that we see primarily growing under ash juniper and seem to falter and fade when they don't have that ash juniper component, like Texas and drone and Texas red oaks. Uh, there are this 72 rare orchids comes from a a juniper reference document that Lisa O'Donnell has online. And so I'm trying to understand if that's talking about juniper oak woodlands forests, like, you know, nationwide. It's uh, not about only here in the hill country, but there is an orchid that occurs in the hill country and it does occur under these ash junipers. Uh, and then there's several other species of plants that are endemic to Texas and also um, wildlife that are endemic to Texas, and it's because of these ash junipers and the function that they provide. So here's a red oak seedling and a larkspur that's growing under an ash juniper. And you can see back behind it, you've got these hills that are covered in ash juniper trees. And here's the little red oak seedling growing under this tiny ash juniper that's trying to take over this cobbly, um, bare soil here where there's been historical clearing. There's some evidence of historical clearing. Um, so this stuff back in the back, the way that I look at it is that it's the top layer of a sponge on our um, hill country aquifer and soil system. And that sponge acts to deflect the water and to allow it to percolate into that really high and organic matter soil which allows it to infiltrate down into the ground and get into our aquifers and keep our hills full of water. This is a giant madrone. I would like to see this one in person growing side by side with an ash juniper tree. So I typically see, I've only seen madrones growing from under an ash juniper canopy. Um, ash junipers frequently act as that mother tree. So um, when we get rainfall on an ash juniper, it acts to catch that rainfall to absorb it into its leaves where it can evaporate it and keep those rain systems going, keep that moisture in the atmosphere to attract more moisture. Uh, when it falls on this bare ground, it's water shedding. So that water is gonna 
work like runoff and just go downstream. Another madrone growing with an ash juniper with a closed canopy or almost closed canopy. This is a pretty young forest, but it is starting to function in that sponge way. And you can see how the top of those trees really look like the top of a sponge with holes in it and you know little tiny holes for water to get absorbed and to keep that moisture in the air. Um, more of that where you can see erosion and pedestaling of the species because the water flow is so high that it's eroding all the soils that don't have vegetation holding them together. This is a um, little walnut, little walnut, yeah. Me a minute, sorry. Uh, and it's got ash junipers growing underneath it. This is the dog hair form of ash juniper where uh, when it's fully sunlit and there's a lot of juniper seedlings that all come up like at once, which is what would happen in an old growth forest when a mother tree dies and leaves an opening in the canopy, you would have a thousand of her seedlings all come up at once and they grow really tall and straight because they're all reaching and competing for that light and trying to be the first one to make it up into the top of the canopy so that they can spread out their branches and you know be the winner. So a lot of people are tempted to clear out these ash junipers underneath it and this is what I see happen is those get delimbed or even removed and immediately feral hogs come in and root up everything and eat all of the potential seedling crop out of the soil so that um, that mother tree ends up not having any of her own seedlings able to grow in that area. So we um, often think of ash juniper as a detriment to these other trees, like it's choking them out, but it's actually protecting them from herbivory in some areas. Uh, so here's another madrone growing under an ash juniper, and you can see that accumulation of organic matter and grasses under the ash juniper. Uh, I'm going to skip this infographic. It's just a cool one that talks about trees in general. Um, so all the same things that we've already talked about. And this shows an older growth ash juniper forest. And what you notice here is that there aren't a lot of ash juniper seedlings coming up under these trees. And that's because it's getting on to the point of having some of that biodiversity and having other species be able to grow in that understory. There's a little baby seedling ash juniper growing in the crook of a dead ash juniper stump with all that moss. Our hill country forests are just astoundingly biodiverse. Um, the point of this slide is really that 2 million people depend on the drinking water of the uh, Edwards Aquifer. And so if we want to protect our own ability to live in this area, we need to make sure that our aquifers stay full of water and that we protect those aquifers from pollution. And ash juniper actually offers us a really great way to make sure that that water gets into the aquifers and is soaked into the land rather than just running off into our streams and causing flooding. So I have some thank yous up there. I have my name at the bottom. and. Um, this picture goes along with a slide from, I've forgotten the name now, Save Our Water. And it's, um, it is if you want rain, grow trees. So I'm gonna look through these uh, comments and answer uh, questions for you guys. And if there's anything else that y'all wanna chat about, uh, feel free to put a comment in there. That was a great presentation. Okay. Is all of the hill country geology a remnant of the Appalachian Range? I think I talked about that. It seems to me like it is all connected and uh, the vegetation is still connected. And if you read about the Washita Mountains in Oklahoma, they talk about their ancient connection to uh, the Appalachians. And we know that our vegetation is connected to the Washita Mountains. So yeah, it, it does seem like that is uh, the entire hill country is connected to that ancient mountain range. Uh, how do prairie lands get into that scenario? How much do the grasses transpire and add to the rainfall? So the biotic pump can get pretty complicated pretty quickly, but the big thing to remember about grasslands, if you've ever stood in a grassland, you know how hot they get in Texas in the summer. And so 
um, they lose a lot of moisture and then they don't have more moisture to draw from. They don't keep moisture in the ground or in their trunks uh, to the same degree that a forest would and they're not keeping a lot of moisture in those leaves and within the atmosphere surrounding them. So it gets very hot and dry in grasslands in the summertime especially. Whereas in a forest, um, because they're shading the ground, there's much cooler temperatures, which allows there to be more moisture in the air, um, even during the summer. So it can often be kind of sweaty in the um, forest. So should mesquite and weed thatch be considered a keystone species in Central Texas? I have not researched that, but I'm sure that they are keystone to some of those ecological processes. And a lot of these species, an important thing to remember is we see them as a nuisance because they don't go along with what we want to do with the land, but they're here in such high numbers because of what we've historically done to destroy that productivity and the biodiversity of the land. And so a lot of those species that we see as nuisance species or invaders are actually rebuilding the productivity that we've taken out of that land. So yeah, I think probably so. Um, does the evidence of fire scars correlate with drought years? They are doing some more research. They're expanding the number of trees that they're looking at those um, fire scars and counting rings from, and uh, they're looking all across the Balcones Canyon lands at this point, instead of just in the preserve system there by Austin and the Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, so I'll be excited to see what they learn from that data. And they're also looking at um, our rainfall patterns with historical clearing. And so they're using uh, aerial photography to look at some of those and and see what we can learn about our history and how we've impacted our own precipitation cycles here in the whole country. Uh, how well do they compete against invasives like China berry, Mandina, or Chinese pistachio? I don't know much about Chinese pistachio. China berry and Mandina tend to occur in wetter areas, as far as I know. Um, I'm, I'm not an expert on any of those species. Uh, I mostly see China berry on the rivers, and so that's not where we're seeing ash juniper growing for the most part. It's where we have like bald cypress and those kind of relic swamp communities. Um, and so I don't think that they're co occurring at this point, but I would expect at some point we will start seeing invasives that are on like our hillsides and slopes, more where we have that ash juniper component. And um, I'm actually terrified that we're going to end up having something that outcompetes it in a highly negative way or a bug or something that gets into the system because it, it is overly dominated at this point and it is one age class from when we historically cleared. And so we have this really disruptive community already, which makes it very susceptible to any of those kind of destructive events. Uh, let's see, there has been so much recent teaching of how the ash junipers cause problems, like keeping water from going into the ground from Bamberger Ranch, allelopathic issues, et cetera, until it's clear and clear so the springs reopen. This seems to be showing that this is not so. Yeah, so that's kind of what I hope that you guys get from this presentation is that um, a lot of that information that we were told historically was based on. Um, you know, one year single observations where we were thinking about only what was happening right now in the immediate time frame rather than long term observations. And the longer that we go, where we're getting more information about the hill country, and especially where we're able to look at like aerial photos of the entire hill country and historical aerial photos and topography and um, analyze the system as an ecosystem, the more that we're learning about how this species actually helps us. Uh, there was a recent paper by um, the Wilcox Ecohydrology Lab out of um, Texas A&M Kingsville, and they uh, showed that junipers actually infiltrate more rainwater than grasslands. And they were thinking going into it that they would show the opposite effect. So, um, and that paper just came out at the end of 2020. As soon as I finish answering these questions, I will thank you, Carol, for helping um, post 
some links to the different information that I used to make this presentation and places for y'all to further explore some of these concepts. Um, our ash juniper is being planted to replace what has been lost. Colleen, I'm so excited about this idea. Uh, and City of Austin is doing quite a bit of work with um, berms and swales to replace those hillside ecosystems and get more water to infiltrate in those hillsides. And then they're planting with a diversity of different species. And uh, they've actually been working too on putting like acorns under ash juniper trees and having those come up in the future. And so um, what we're seeing is that maybe we don't have to plant ash junipers, but we can use them as mother trees for that forest and increase the biodiversity that's growing under them. Because waiting for that, it potentially would take centuries for that biodiversity to spread throughout those systems. Um, we are looking at doing some inoculations. We haven't had much luck growing ash junipers in pots in the past. Uh, it's something that quite a few biologists have tried. Um, so we're going to try inoculating them with mycelium and seeing if that will help them to grow in pots and be able to be planted and restore those systems on especially some of these hillsides where we historically lost soils. Uh, is it correct then to say the hill country was historically an ash juniper forest with oak savannas in the flatter areas? So some of those flatter areas would have had swamp communities, especially the Balcony Canyon lands. Some of them would have had more of a grassland savanna, um, but it's not the savanna that we're used to seeing in like Fredericksburg where all of the ash junipers are removed and only live oaks remain. And then a lot of times we have barely a grassland system under it. It would have been those flat areas that are able to accumulate deep soils and hold moisture in those soils. And it would have most likely had an almost complete canopy of overstory like post oak and hickory forests and then had that savanna component in the bottom where bison could have come and grazed to those areas and kept those areas as grassland systems in the understory and the overstory would have been these um, these trees that we see in those systems, like the post oak savanna that stretches all the way to Oklahoma. Uh, from what I've seen, when there's live oak savanna, those live oaks almost always end up with oak oil. So I think that there's possibly a fungal fighting component to ash juniper that helps those live oaks survive with oak wilt in the system and not succumb to it. And when we remove all those ash junipers, it crashes the system. Uh, can you talk to all my friends so they will understand we need cedar? I would love to. <laughs> uh, the artwork behind me is the 59 Park series and it is uh, from all of the, they've done different posters for different national parks. This is the Great Smoky Mountains, Yosemite, and Yellowstone, I believe. Um, and down here is an article from Bracken Bat Cave Protection. And this is the Guadalupe Bass from Guadalupe Bass Restoration Project on the Blanco River, which has been ongoing for about 10 years now since the drought of 2011. So exactly 10 years, that's amazing. Uh, the city of Austin Biosville project, thank you for that. Juniper Duff as a germination medium. Uh, some of the city of Austin folks have done that to grow different species and they grew grasses and different trees in it and found that they grew just as easily in Juniper Duff as they do in other mediums and um, I believe the people who have successfully been able to germinate the drones and grow the drone trees have been able to do it because they include juniper duck in their um, soil but that's something that I'm still researching so if anybody has information on that I'd be really interested to hear about it. Thank you for that link to the Bioswell project that's a really cool project um, and that um, one that y'all can check out and volunteer on once we're out of pandemic stages. Okay. Awesome, beautiful duff. Okay, uh, I have seedlings sprout out duff. I brought back from plant rescues. I don't have junipers around me. 
Yeah, so as we go further north in the Hill Country and further west in the Hill Country, um, the junipers wouldn't have historically been a component of that. And a lot of that has to do with the bison being removed from those areas that we're seeing it appear there where we haven't had it historically. And then there also would have been a fire component as you go further north and further west in the Hill Country. Uh, oak savannas were only reported in the Black Valley and Prairie. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Uh, let's see, so what is the takeaway from the Bamberger Restoration Project and its ability to restore spring flow? Um, I would be really interested to dig into some of Bamberger's data on the spring flow and his restoration projects. I know that originally he cleared a lot of cedar and then regretted it, and so if you go to Bamberger Ranch and see what their restoration is, they actually did not clear all the cedar on that property. And Bamberger is an interesting um, example of the hill country because it's on the edge of the Balcones Canyonlands and the Edwards Plateau Woodlands. So it's actually a mixture of those different areas. And there are some um, Chinook grassland communities on Bamberger Ranch, which is not a part of the Balcones Canyonlands. It's very much a part of the Edwards Plateau Woodlands and would be more of that grazed community historically with bison. Um, so Bamberger's a really interesting example of what's going on, but the rumors that people share about clear all your trees like Bamberger did, that's not what Bamberger did. That's not what he actually suggests if you visit the ranch and see what work they've done. It's a very thoughtful approach. Uh, yeah, so Elizabeth is, uh, hi, Elizabeth. <laughs> uh, Bamberger Springs previously existed. They were hidden by and tied up in the soil under the pioneering thickets of ash juniper. So yeah, that's something that I hadn't uh, ever thought about, Elizabeth, is that uh, Bamberger Ranch would have historically been cleared before Bamberger's ownership, and so he would have come in with pioneering thickets rather than like an old growth forest that he cleared. Um, so it's just, it, it's a new way of thinking about how we manage the hill country and what we want for the future. And I think especially when we start talking about climate change and carbon sequestration and water and the availability of fresh water, uh, it starts to become kind of obvious that leaning on our natural vegetation and that natural infrastructure really supports our ability to provide those ecological services. And we have to, as a community of people who want to be naturalized with our ecological services, we have to provide and value those services. And it's something we've always gotten for free. So we kind of look at it like, oh, yay, water, you know, trees, we can just do whatever we want. Well, there's hundreds of years of growth that go into those trees. There's thousands or potentially millions of years of growth that go into that soil, and it's irreplaceable. It's priceless. So we really have to start valuing these systems. So I went about 10 minutes over, but if anybody has anything else they'd like to chat about, this is my passion and my love, and um, I'm really excited to learn with you guys and share what I'm learning today. So thank you for this opportunity.